Every town has a dark side. At 18 years old back in 2005, Jordan Vandersloot became the prime suspect in Aruba's most high-profile case in the island's history, the disappearance of Natalie Holloway. While that case is still officially unsolved, just five years after that, Jordan was involved in yet another sensational case, the murder of Stephanie Flores Ramirez down in Lima, Peru in 2010. While denying him and his friends' involvement in Natalie's questionable disappearance, Mr. Vandersloot did confess to the bludgeoning of Stephanie in June of 2010 as the video evidence against him was damning. At only 24 years old, Jordan was then arrested and sentenced to 28 years in prison for the killing of Miss Flores. Hey guys, I'm Andrew and welcome to another episode of Every Town, where today we're taking a look at one of the strangest stories in recent memory. At the center of it all is a young man named Jordan. Chances are you've heard of the Natalie Holloway case if you're a true crime fan, but Getting the whole story in here is something that's pretty crazy. For example, just recently in January of 2023, Jordan was sentenced to another 18 years for cocaine trafficking while in prison. So let's head on down to Aruba and then Peru, and we're going to hear all the strange details surrounding these cases and the man accused of them. The parents of Jordan Vandersloot, Paulus, a lawyer, and Anita, an art teacher, seemed to have built a wonderful family when Jordan was born on August 6, 1987, in Arnhem, a city in the eastern part of the Netherlands. When Jordan was three, his family moved to Aruba together with his two brothers, and there he grew up working hard at becoming an honor student at the International School of Aruba, bringing pride to his entire family. He was an athlete, standing six foot five, he was great at soccer, and a tennis player, making him the school's star athlete. Jordan also competed in doubles tennis with his father at the Moe Sham Don Anniversary Cup in 2005, and hoped to bring his talents to St. Leo University in Florida after graduating high school. While he was well-liked, and if you met him in passing, you may even be charmed by him, those who were really close with him, like his mother Anita, saw a different side of the boy. She always had that mother's instinct that Jordan may attract trouble in his life. He had an impulse to lie often, and was caught sneaking out of the house many times to go to bars and casinos despite being young. She may have said it best with her words, he lost his way along the way. It was gradual. And it was here in Aruba where Jordan crossed paths with Memphis, Tennessee native Natalie Holloway, who went missing mysteriously in a foreign land during a high school graduation trip. And to this day, her or her remains have not been found. Eighteen-year-old Natalie Ann Holloway was the oldest of Dave and Beth Holloway's two kids. She was born in October of 1986. Her parents ended up divorcing in 1993, so she and her brother Matthew were primarily raised by their mother. Beth found another chance at love and married George Jug Twitty, a prominent Alabama businessman. And after that, the family moved to Mountain Brook, Alabama. In May of 2005, Natalie graduated with honors from Mountain Brook High School. She also proved to be a well-rounded student as a member of the National Honor Society and the school's dance squad. She was scheduled to attend the University of Alabama on a full scholarship, planning to pursue a pre-med degree, so everything was looking bright for the All-American girl. 
Natalie, along with 124 of her fellow graduates from high school, all went on a graduation trip to Aruba that year. They arrived on the island on May 25th, planning to stay for almost a week, while they stayed at the lovely beachfront Holiday Inn property. The newly graduates flew down to celebrate on the gorgeous beaches and enjoy the nightlife there. And to ensure their safety, seven chaperones went along with them. But Jody Bierman, who organized the trip, stated, The chaperones were not supposed to keep up with their every move. After all, many of these teens were technically adults, including Natalie, who was 18 years old, and so they were free to essentially roam wherever their hearts desired. During their stay, Police Commissioner Gerald Dompig, who handled the investigation of Natalie's missing case from mid-2005 to 2006, stated that the students, including Natalie, engaged in some wild parties, a lot of drinking, and switching of rooms every night. Domping further added, Natalie, we know, she drank all day, every day. We have statements she started every morning with cocktails, so much drinking that Natalie didn't show up for breakfast on two mornings. On May 29th, Jordan, who lived in the nearby town of Nord, approached Natalie's group to have a chat as they enjoyed the last evening of their Caribbean vacation. Jordan later joined the girls at the popular Carlos and Charlie's Bar in downtown Orangestad, where he drank and danced with Natalie. Sometime after the bar closed at 1 a.m., Miss Holloway was seen leaving in a car with Mr. Vandersloot and his two Surinamese friends, brothers Deepak Kalpo, who was 21 years old and the car owner, and 18-year-old Saltish Kalpo. Natalie was scheduled to fly home that day, May 30th, but she never arrived to the airport with the rest of her classmates. But her passport and packed luggage were found in her hotel room, Immediately, the Reuben authorities launched a search throughout the island and surrounding waters, hoping to locate the girl. On May 30th, immediately after Natalie's disappearance was made known to her parents, her mother and stepfather flew down to Aruba. Upon landing, the Twitties presented the authorities with the name and address of Jordan Vandersloot, which they had obtained from the manager of the Holiday Inn, who recognized him from a CCTV video feed. The Twitties then went to the Vandersloot home themselves, accompanied by two Aruban police officers. Initially, Jordan denied knowing or even meeting Natalie, but he then told a story corroborated by his friend Deepak, who was with him at the house at the time. Jordan explained that he and the Calpo brothers drove Miss Holloway to the California lighthouse area of Arashi Beach because she wanted to see the sharks. Later, they dropped her off at her hotel at around 2 a.m. Jordan also emphasized that Natalie fell down as she exited the car but refused his help. He then stated that as he and the Calpo brothers were driving away, a dark man in a black shirt similar to what security guards wore, approached Natalie in the dark. A massive search and rescue effort for Natalie soon began involving hundreds of volunteers from Aruba and the U.S., Literally thousands of civil servants were given days off from work to help chip in. Fifty Dutch Marines conducted searches underwater along the shoreline. And Reuben Banks also raised $20,000 and provided other support 
to aid volunteer search teams. American law extended full cooperation with the Rubin authorities from the early days of the disappearance. U.S. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice stated to reporters that the U.S. was in constant contact with the Rubin authorities. On June 5th of 2005, the police then made their first arrest. And the suspects were former security guards of a hotel closed down for renovations. The two former guards were known for cruising hotels to try to pick up women. And at least one of them had a prior incident with law enforcement, at least according to a statement from Vandersloot and Calpo, which became a factor in the arrest of the two guards. But eventually they were released after eight days without being charged due to a lack of evidence. And then the time came for Jordan and his friends to face the music. On June 9th, Mr. Vandersloot and the Calpo brothers were arrested on suspicion of the abduction and murder of Miss Holloway, although they continued to deny any involvement. The brothers would go on to change their story of the night's events on many occasions. Despite that, on July 4th, they were released while Jordan remained in custody. Deepak and Saltish were rearrested on August 26th on suspicion of rape and murder, but again, due to lack of substantial evidence, all three of the young men were then released. And although he may have been let go, Jordan was required to stay within Dutch territory while the investigation was still ongoing. Jordan wanted to return to the Netherlands to study international business management at the Han University of Applied Sciences starting in September of 2005. As such, on September 14th, a higher court removed the travel restrictions. Police Commissioner Gerald Domping stated that the initial arrests were made prematurely under pressure from Holloway's family. He also went on to imply that the Holloway family sidetracked the investigation altogether by making it difficult for the police to collect evidence that they needed to solve the case. In the months following his release, Jordan gave several interviews that explained his version of the events. The most notable interview was shown on Fox News over three nights in March of 2006. During that, Jordan indicated that Natalie wanted to have sex with him, but he didn't because he didn't have a condom. He further explained that the girl wanted them to stay on the beach that night, but that he refused because he had to be in school early the next morning. According to Jordan now, He was picked up by Satish at about 3 a.m. and left Holloway sitting on that beach. But in 2005, Satish's attorney stated that his client had gone to sleep and had never returned to drive Jordan home. So, as you can see, the stories were all over the place, which is why this became such a sensational case. But in the end, without a body and real hard evidence, it was impossible to lay down formal charges. In January of 2006, some of Natalie's classmates were re-interviewed by the FBI and Aruban authorities. Sand dunes on the northwest coast of Aruba were then searched for Natalie's body in March and April, but they found nothing. Before Commissioner Domping retired from handling the case, he expressed doubts that Natalie was murdered, but perhaps died of alcohol and or drug poisoning, and that someone hit her body afterwards. Of course, though, the Holloway family deny that their daughter used drugs. On December 14, 2006, Natalie's parents took legal action against the Calpo brothers. George Twitty and Dave Holloway took aim at the other two primary suspects and filed a wrongful death suit against the Calpo brothers in Los Angeles Superior Court. However, Location, once again, proved the undoing, as a judge dismissed the suit over a lack of jurisdiction on June 1st of 2007. 
The arrest, though, continued in November of 2007, while Jordan was attending school in the Netherlands, and the Calpos were held in Aruba after the emergence of what was described as new incriminating evidence on suspicion of involvement in manslaughter and causing serious bodily harm that resulted in the death of Holloway. Yet again, on November 30th, a judge ordered the release of the Calpo brothers. The prosecution appealed, but that was denied. Mr. Vandersloot was released without charge on December 7th due to a lack of evidence that Ms. Holloway had died from a violent crime. The prosecution then expressed it would not appeal anymore. And on December 18th, prosecutor Hans Mose officially declared the case closed. A little over a year later, something interesting happened. On February 3rd of 2008, Jordan claimed on a hidden camera that Natalie's body was dumped in the ocean. In a broadcast of the hidden camera footage, set up by Dutch reporter Peter DeVries, Vandersloot told an associate that Miss Holloway had collapsed when they were on the beach together, and unable to revive her, he had a friend help dispose of her body with a boat. When he was made aware that his statements were actually recorded, Jordan then insisted that he was lying. In an email to Mrs. Twitty's lawyer, John Q. Kelly, on May 29th of 2010, Jordan offered to reveal the location of Ms. Holloway's body in exchange for $25,000 up front and another $225,000 to come after. Kelly agreed, relayed this info to the FBI, and the following day, attorney Kelly took $10,000 in cash with her and met up with Vandersloot, who then led them to a house where he said his father had buried Natalie in its foundation. That day, another $15,000 was wired to Jordan's bank account in the Netherlands. But still, nothing Jordan Vandersloot said led to his arrest, as that house, he pointed out, had not been built yet at the time of the girl's disappearance. This case then went really cold. Eventually, in 2012, Natalie was declared legally dead. Her disappearance was never solved, a body never found. But instead, Vandersloot would end up behind bars for an entirely different and brutal crime. Twenty-one-year-old Peruvian business student Stephanie Flores Ramirez was about to finish her courses at the University of Lima. Her father, Ricardo Flores, was a prominent figure. He was a former president of the Peruvian Automobile Club and winner of the Caminos del Inca rally back in 1991. A well-known businessman and entertainment organizer, he ran for vice president in 2001 and for president five years later on a fringe ticket. On May 14, 2010, Jordan had entered Peru via Colombia to attend the Latin American Poker Tour tournament that was going on. Then on May 30th, the exact fifth anniversary of Natalie's disappearance, Jordan crossed paths, perhaps by fate, with Stephanie at the Atlantic City Casino in Lima, Peru. According to Jordan's mother, Anita, he had gone there to gamble instead of getting the mental health treatment that he needed back in the Netherlands. In Lima, Jordan met Stephanie while playing cards and eventually invited her to his hotel room. They walked into room 309 at the Hotel TAC together, all of which was caught on security cameras, but it was only Vandersloot who emerged from that room. On June 2nd, Flores' badly beaten body was discovered inside the room, registered under Jordan's name. He was gone, of course, having left the hotel without returning the room key and leaving the television on. 
A hotel guest and an employee then came forward to say they saw Jordan and Stephanie entering the hotel room together, and the police obtained video of the two playing cards at the same table the night before the incident took place. According to Stephanie's dad during the investigation, date rape drugs were found in Stephanie's car, parked about 50 blocks from the hotel. Her jewelry, money, identification, and credit cards were missing as well, including around $1,000 her father had given her to buy a laptop and over $10,000 of her casino winnings from earlier. A tennis racket found inside room 309 was identified by the coroner as the possible homicide weapon. And very quickly, authorities were able to identify and pick up Jordan, who had since fled to Chile. Initially, just like in Natalie's case, he maintained his innocence, but after being presented with the video evidence, confessed four days later that he had, in fact, murdered Miss Flores in a fit of rage. He told the Peruvian police that he and Stephanie had been playing poker in his room when a message regarding Natalie Holloway popped up on his computer. Stephanie became upset and hit him, so he also hit her in the face with his elbow, then grabbed her by the throat and banged her head against the wall before smothering her with a shirt. In another version of Jordan's tale, he caught her reading about the Holloway case on his computer, and lashed out because of that. In his own words, he said, I didn't want to do it, but the girl intruded in my life. In the aftermath of this, Jordan retracted his confession because he claimed he'd been scared and confused and the Peruvian authorities had promised he could be extradited to the Netherlands if he told them what they wanted to hear. But he eventually pleaded guilty again to murdering Stephanie, and even his mother admitted that he could have done something to the 21-year-old girl. I need to believe Jordan had nothing to do with the disappearance of Natalie Holloway in 05 and said he had left her on the beach, but Stephanie he may have killed. After Jordan was found guilty of murdering Flores, he was sentenced to 28 years in prison. Once released, he would likely be extradited to the United States, where he would now face charges of extortion and fraud in connection to the tall tales he told about Natalie's body being buried under the foundation of that house. Vandersloot admitted that he lied about that, saying that he just wanted to get back at Natalie's family for making his life a living hell for the past five years. But in the meantime, it seems that Jordan Vandersloot will remain behind bars in the Chalapalca prison in southern Peru for the foreseeable future. Convicted of killing Stephanie Flores and suspected of murdering Natalie Holloway, he may spend the rest of his life in prison, especially if he's found guilty of the extortion and fraud charges in the U.S. And as mentioned in the beginning of this episode, in January of 2023, he received an additional 18 years. So if his terms go the distance, he'll be 70 years old when he faces the fraud charges, assuming he doesn't do something else to get more time at it. Mother Anita pleaded in 2010. He can be very gentle, but it could be that he has bipolar personality. I hope he gets the help he needs that in return would help authorities find closure in Natalie Holloway's case. So that's going to do it, guys, for this week's episode of Every Town. Thank you so much for tuning in. Remember, if you want to watch this, go check out our YouTube channel called Scary Mysteries. Please tune in next week for another episode filled with scary, strange, and mysterious stories. Because you never know, your town might be next.